Welcome to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Our mission is to bring you discussions on a wide array of topics in the coaching world to grow players on and off the court. You can connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, and also reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Now, here's your host, Coach Mike Hernandez. Welcome back. Thank you guys so much for joining us for another episode, wherever you are and on whatever platform you are listening on. I know I say it every episode, but as always, your support is so greatly appreciated. So thank you so much for spreading the word and spreading this podcast to others. I greatly appreciate it. Now, on to today's topic. I think today's topic is one that a lot of coaches wrestle with come tryouts, and then they wrestle again with it when it's time to actually coach in a game. We're going to talk today about the concept of going deep into your bench, using a lot of players, rotating players in and out, and how to maximize all of the players that you have on your team. I know that some coaches out here listening go really deep in the bench, some don't. There, there's a lot of different philosophies that exist one way or the other. Uh, but today we're going to talk to a coach who does go deep into their bench, who does use a lot of players and, and kind of pick pick his brain, so to speak, and, and figure out the way that he utilizes those strategies and, and have a conversation about using everybody. So I'm very happy and very excited to be joined by uh, Coach John Palicki today to discuss this topic. Coach, how are you doing today? I'm good, Coach. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. It's a pleasure. I'm really looking forward to this one. I know I always deal with this question as somebody who's feels like I always take on more players and sometimes I know what to do with. So I think I'm going to learn a lot from this as well. So coach, let's go ahead and uh, get started into you. Uh, where's the game taking you? Where are you at right now? And what's your coaching journey been like? Well, you know, I, I currently I'm the head basketball coach, uh, head girls basketball coach at Resurrection College Prep High School in Chicago. Um, you know, I, I kind of started from the bottom up. I started uh, real early on in my career when I was 17. I was coaching sixth grade boys. Um, I, I kind of moved up through the ranks, seventh grade, eighth grade. Um, I got my big, my big break uh, when I moved on to uh, Dominican University. Uh, that was actually my first time coaching on the women's side. Um, I coached mm-hmm. there, and then I moved on to St. Vider High School in Arlington Heights, um, and then uh, as the sophomore coach for a couple of years, and then uh, for the last five years, this will be my fifth season at Resurrection High School um, on the girls' side, so I've done about half my time on the, on the boys, half my time on the girls, so, uh, and I've, I've done as little as sixth grade and as old as uh, 22 years old, so I've, I've kind of hit the gamut there. For sure. And I like to always ask this question to to coaches who have experience with both. When coaching boys and girls, what are some things that you've noticed uh, were were similar and and what are some ways that they're different? What's kind of that experience been uh, being on both sides of it? You know, I've become a a big time advocate for women's athletics. There you go, coach. uh, (laughs) You know, women's, women's sports do not get the level of appreciation that they deserve. Um, you know, obviously in the boys game, it's, it's a very athletic game. It's a very up and down game. Uh, it's a very, you know, game based on athleticism and, and dunking and shooting the three. And, uh, but I, I love it. This will be my uh, eighth year, uh, seventh year after coaching the, the, on the, the men's side for seven years. And, and I, I love the women's game. I, I think it's fundamental. And I, I think it is so underappreciated how much heart and effort and hustle and commitment um, that the young women uh, that play basketball um, give on a daily basis. You know, people don't see the the times in the training room when they're getting taped up and iced up and, and how much heart and hustle and and commitment that these young women give. I I love and have become a major advocate for, for women's athletics. And I think that in my experience, I've talked to so many coaches, males specifically for this, who had apprehension coaching girls and then once they did they like fell in love with it now some went back to coach boys later but I don't think I've ever talked to a coach or maybe I just ignored them I don't think I've ever talked to a coach who gave coaching girls a shot and then like couldn't stand it or hated it I I think everybody 
enjoyed that experience. Like you said, it's it's very unique. It's it's very different. And uh, any chance I get personally on this show, I like to advocate for for girls basketball. So I want to make sure I ask that question as well. Um, now, before we get into this topic, something that I, I personally found uh, interesting in, in your own biography is, is your work as a behavioral specialist. Uh, now, those who have listened to, to my podcast, they know that we've done a uh, teen mental health series talking to various uh, mental health professionals, and, and your work definitely deals with, uh, with that sort of side of things with the student body. So I'm curious for you, since you are coach as well as having that position, what have you learned from your job as a behavioral specialist that you think applies to coaching and that might be useful for, for other coaches as well? You know, working with young people is so important to me. Mm -hmm. And, you know, young people are constantly growing and they're constantly learning, you know, and it's our job to know the why of the behavior. You know, oftentimes when, when an adolescent teen, uh, a child, you know, demonstrates a behavior, what do we all ask? We always say, you know, the who, the what, the where, the when, and the how of the behavior. But we forget to ask the why of the behavior. So, no, you know, no matter if it's working with students or, you know, I'm working with teachers to help support the students or working with my student athletes, you know, I constantly try to remind myself, my assistants, um, you know, let's remember the why of the behavior. If a player acts out, why are they acting out? What, what message are they trying to communicate? Um, and, you know, the second thing that I always say that I always preach to everybody around me and, and people probably get sick of me saying it is to me, it's all about the phrase, just take care of the kids. Um, you know, in the end, in this profession, in education and teaching, coaching, administration, you know, none of us got into it for the money, um, you know, and, and I, you know, I try to tell people all the time, you know, even in, in education or coaching, you know what, the paperwork's always going to be there. The, the, the extra things are always going to be there, but in the end, it always comes down to, we got into this to just take care of the kids. So that's a big mantra for me, whether it's in education or in the coaching aspect is I always want to sure, make sure that my kids are taken care of. So just to kind of follow up on that, what, what are some situations maybe that you come across just in your day-to-day -day coaching where you have to think to yourself or a light bulb goes in your mind like, oh, I got to make sure I'm taking care of the kids. Are there any specific moments or instances where that kind of jumps in your mind as you're going through your coaching? I think the first thing is, you know, with coaching, you, you want to have an, an open line of communication. Mm -hmm. if, if a player has a concern, I want them to come to me and say, hey, coach, why am I not playing more? Hey, coach, I got this issue. Can we talk about it? Um, you know, I kind of have in thinking, you know, what we had a we had a player who um, had a relative pass and and they sent me an email that said, you know, uh, our big program motto is family stays united. And for me to have a kid send me an email after, after a family member passes and say, hey, coach, I want to let you know that my family member passed because you always preach family stays united. I think that's just so much more important than anything you could ever do win mm -hmm. or loss wise. Mm -hmm. I think that's what really taking care of the kids is, is all about to me. You know, the most important things to me and the, my favorite things are when kids ask me, hey, coach, can you write me a letter of reference? Hey, coach, can you help me um, with this letter to get into college? Hey, coach, can you be a reference for a job down the line? Those things are so much more important to me than any win or loss I could ever experience. And completely agree with that. I actually had a player uh, a week ago ask me, uh, to use me rather for like a reference and then later on to, to write a letter recommendation and the feeling that I personally got from that versus from coaching, it's just a completely different feeling. And it's completely like fulfilling to have a player who, you know, looks at you in that way or trusts you in that way and, and wants to, you know, use you to, to speak on their behalf and speak about their character. It's, it's, it's really awesome. And uh, I, I completely agree. And I really like the family mantra. I feel that a lot of coaches who, have successful programs, whether that's in the win-loss record or just successful programs um, in general, just as people and as character building, a lot of them preach that that, that family dynamic and, and looking out for one another and that open line of communication. So uh, that, that is great and uh, something I think all, all coaches either do aspire for or definitely should aspire to, to try and do that as best as possible as well. That's awesome. Uh, so it's funny that you brought up as a uh, hypothetical 
hypothetical question, the idea of a player asking, hey, coach, why am I not playing more? Because it's a good segue into our topic, which is the concept of going deep into your bench and using many players. Now, I'll admit this struck me to talk to you about this because I was looking at your Twitter and I saw your Twitter banner picture. And I think it's from a regional uh, plaque and I just saw these girls on it. I was like, wow, that's a lot of players that you you had on this team. And so I, I really am, was got really curious about this. So I'm going to start off, Coach, with just asking, like, what is your philosophy that kind of leads to you using so many players and having so many players on your team? Was this a philosophy that you've always had? Have you kind of adapted over time? Can you, can you kind of walk us through that? Yeah, you know, I, I think with, like with anything, you know, it, it grew over time. Uh, you know, I think it's all about giving people ownership. Um, you know, this goes for any part of your program. You know, for me, you know, I want every player, and when I say player, I mean anybody associated with the program to feel a sense of ownership. So first and foremost, you know, it's the, it's the coaches, the administration, the players, the support staff, the parents, um, you know, down to our athletic trainer, who's phenomenal, to, um, you know, the custodial staff who helps us set up. You know, I, I want everybody to feel a part of it. You know, our big, as I said, our big thing in our program is we are one big family. Uh, just on the coach's side, before I get into the player's side, you know, mm -hmm. on, our, on our staff, on my varsity staff, Obviously, I have a JV and a freshman team, but on our varsity staff, you know, all three of my assistants have different pieces that they're responsible for. And, and I think it, it helps them develop a sense of ownership, you know, whether it's um, we rotate the scouting reports on, on specific opponents. Um, you know, some, some assistants may work with the guards, some may work with the forwards. You know, I have, one, I have one coach in particular that's just in charge of rebounding, one coach that's just in charge of warm-ups pregame. Um, you know, one that's in charge of just collecting uh, the, the scouting films. So, you know, it, it's, it's all about making sure that they have that ownership. Um, as far as players, you know, not only on the court, but off the court, I want everybody to, you know, learn to embrace their role. So obviously, like every program, I'm sure your program, you know, we have, we have captains who are elected by, by the players. Um, but, you know, we even have littler jobs, like who brings the med kit on the bus to a game? Who takes the blood jersey? Who takes the iPod and uh, the iPad and the tripod uh, to to the game? And and I think that's so important in in everyone having a role. As far as on the court, I I think here's kind of how our style of play builds into it: is we play very fast. Um, we like to play fast. I want to score in under seven seconds if possible. Um, we play a very um, aggressive type of zone defense. Uh, we actually run four different zones um, dur during a game based off a color system. But, you know, to me, because we play so fast, it also lends itself a little bit to playing a lot of players. Mm -hmm. But I also think it has to do a lot with player development. You know, we, we want to develop all of the players – um, you know, within our program to be able to play more players. You know, I, I think a, as a coach, this will be my fifth year. You know, I think by your fifth, sixth, seventh year, I, I think player development is, is a major deal in being able to play more players. And it, the, the last piece I would say is it's, it's about understanding player strengths. Let's say, you know, the other team has a really good uh, ball handler. Well, I may have one particular player that's a great on-ball defender, and in that game, they may play more minutes. Or, for example, I may have a player that's a really good ball handler, and we're really playing a pressure defensive team. So I think that's where that player comes into play. So I think it's, it's all about understanding your player strengths, your opponent's strengths, and then kind of equaling them off. Like, in a game player X, Y, and Z may play a little bit more because their strengths are, are better suited to our opponent versus another game where maybe they, the other team is a little bigger. Well, maybe in that game, mm -hmm. I need a little bit more size. So I may play those, uh, those players. So I, I would say in the average game, I try to get 11-ish players in per game. Now, as you said, I think obviously as we get into the playoffs, um, you know, that, that might shrink a little bit, but for the most part, you know, I, I like to play 10, 11 kids each game. I, I think it, it helps everybody grow and it, it mm -hmm. gives everyone ownership. And 
you mentioned how one of the ways to incorporate a lot of players is by playing a certain style of basketball that kind of lends itself to needing to kind of put in players, sub players out. You mentioned about your pace of play and, and how fast everything uh, tends to go. So to follow up on that, did you find that you had your pace of play that you wanted and then you sort of realized, oh, I'm going to need a lot of players for this? Or did you kind of go the other way and say, okay, I have a bunch of players. Oh, now I can play this way because look, I have all these players to use. What, what, what was sort of used in developing your system in correlation with the amount of players that you had on your team? You know, so I listened, uh, I was talking to uh, Coach Ryan McCarthy of Alaska Anchorage the other day, and, you know, he made an interesting point that, you know, he would rather have the athlete and turn them into the basketball player mm -hmm. than the basketball player and turn them into the athlete. And, and I thought that was a really interesting kind of way to think about it. Um, you know, we do, we have a lot of solid athletes. One thing I did notice when I got there and, and, you know, my, my players and, and coaches and I like to joke around all the time, like most programs, I don't have a lot of size. I, I don't have, you know, a bunch of six, three, six, two, six, one kids. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we kind of realized, Hey, we got a bunch of kids that are five, 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 six, five, seven. But what we did have was athletes. So, you know, like any coach, I'm not going to say that I have one specific system that, you know, I'm going to try to fit the square peg into the round hole. But I realized, hey, I have a lot of athletes that we can play a faster style that people are uncomfortable with. Mm -hmm. um, that kind of lends more to our success. And the other thing I realized was I have a lot of really smart players so that's kind of why going back to what I said is offensively we're very simple defensively we like to mix a two three a one three one um a two one two gap uh defense uh which is kind of called the buzz if you've ever heard of it and then sure. the amoeba and you know we like to really change up defensively constantly keeping that pressure on the ball um so yeah obviously when you play fast you're going to play a little bit more kids no i'm not saying that we play like a grinnell we're not playing that fast um but we we do like to have a tempo and, and i think kind of going back to what you said it it does a little bit play hand in hand right mm -hmm. you know if, if you have a, if you play a pretty fast style you're gonna have to play a few more kids but you know our belief is that our seventh eighth ninth tenth player is going to be better than the other team's seventh, eighth, ninth, tenth player, if that makes sense. Sure. And I think that one of the things you touched on before was the idea of uh, focusing in on, on player development. And uh, I'll let you touch on that a little bit more, how, how the idea of focusing on player development probably leads to you as, as a coach feeling a little bit more confident in, in playing more players. And so can you talk a little bit more about the, your concept and your staff's concept about focusing on, on player development and, and what you guys do so that you do feel a little bit more comfortable going deeper into your bench? Absolutely. So I'll take a, a kind of a, a two-step uh, process to this answer. So first, you know, in the summer, you know, our summer camp, you know, is, is 9th, 10th, 11th, and 12th graders all together. And, you know, we really believe in, you know, if we scrimmage in the summer with everybody in the gym at the same time, you know, we really like to mix up the teams, you know, so a team may have a senior or two or a junior or two, but it also might have a freshman or two. Mm -hmm. And I, we believe that because we want to expose all of the players to the same type of energy, the same type of tempo, the same type of um, skill set mm -hmm. throughout the program. And I think the other thing that we do, other coaches may or may not do it, but in practice, we don't, I don't have a first string, a second string, a third string. Um, throughout the season, you know, as you said, you know, with, with more kids on my roster, you know, we mix up all the players every day. I want to see different matchups every day. You know, it allows me to see, you know, who's competing at a high level. It allows me to see who wants to be a competitor it allows me to see, sometimes I'll let the kids match up for them with themselves. Mm -hmm. And it allows me to see, you know, like maybe I'm the ninth player in the roster, but you know what? I want to guard the best player on the floor. <laughs> that shows me a lot about that kid, right? That shows me that kid's like, you know what? They may think I'm the ninth player, but in my head, I think I'm the second player. Sure. Um, 
So I, I think those two things are, are very important. You know, competition is important. Um, you know, pr- and again, the, the same thing kind of going back to player development is our practice structure is very up-tempo. Everything we do is timed. So we have the clock going. Every drill we do, even down to water breaks, are timed. Um, it, whether it's a coach or a manager that runs the clock, you know, I'll give them the practice plan. They'll see it. They'll see how long each segment is. And we literally, if one thing is done, if I'll blow the whistle, or, or these days in COVID, I'll, I'll hold the whistle. And the, the manager, the coach who's on the clock knows, hey, start that next seven-minute thing. Start that next six-minute thing. And we don't do things longer than, God, I, I would say maybe 10 minutes. And that's probably more five-on-five five stuff. Because I, I want the tempo to go. I, I want them to get used to playing that fast because, you know, most teams don't practice at that high of a tempo and that just helps us down the line. So anything we do, water breaks, weightlifting, drills, scrimmages, film sessions, it, it's all timed out because I want that consistent, organized, uh, fast pace of everything we do. Well, I think it also lends itself to a certain level of just urgency and just importance of things that there is no there is no time to to be wasted like everything we're gonna go 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 and it's just about efficiency too at that point as well to make sure that you're getting the most you can out of a practice and not wasting transition time or things like that it kind of lends itself to me as a teacher thinking about you know transition time and making sure we go from activity to activity and also like you mentioned about not spending too much time on any one thing and I know as a teacher if you spend you know x amount of time on one activity once you go over that allotted time you lost them or the the learning just isn't going to be as effective as it would be in some things and I know it's hard because it's hard for me as a coach you just have to sort of shelve it go back to it later and just just do something else because if they're not being successful just transition to something else or do something else that they can be successful at and then you know we'll 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 get back to it but yeah like like you kind of mentioned you don't want to sink 30 minutes one because it's not going to be that effective probably and two like there's a bunch of other things that you want to get to <laughs> a bunch of other things that you want to do as well yeah, so you you will lo- you will lose there whether it's in the classroom or on the floor you know as well as I do. After five, six minutes, you're going to lose their concentration. Sure. So you got to keep that pace flowing. Right. And so you have the this idea of player development. You got you got the competition. You got players mixing and matching who, who they play and who they guard. And it all sort of lands where it may, where, where players get the amount of, of playing time that they do. And at some point, just by process of elimination, some player has to be, you know, one of the last few at the end of the bench. And so I'm curious, how do you and your staff, you mentioned it a little bit earlier, so I'll I'll let you touch back on it again, but how do you and your staff kind of keep that player, keep those players engaged who are are working as hard as they can, but there just isn't the space, there just isn't the availability for them to maybe get as much playing time as, as maybe they would like? You know, I think, you know, obviously every, every player, they want to play, right? Mm-hmm. And, and just like every coach, you want to coach. And, and I think that's why that communication is so important. And that's something, you know, going into year 14 of coaching that I learned is be upfront, be honest with the, with the player, mm-hmm. be honest with, you know, what they need to work on. If a player is not playing, if you go up to them and, and ask why they're not playing and they say, I don't know, as a coach, you haven't communicated very well. That would be like for me in the classroom, if a, if a student is asked, why are you failing this class? And they honestly, truly, now again, we have students that'll just say, I don't know to say, I don't know. <laughs> but if they honestly, truly say, I don't know, as a teacher, I probably have not done a good job communicating to that student like, this is why you're not doing well. This is also what you can work on. And my staff and I, we are happy to put in the extra work with all of the players. If they're mm-hmm. willing to put in the extra work, we are willing to put in the extra work. But I think it's very, very important to be upfront in those conversations of, you know what, this is kind of where you are. This is how you can get better. And this is what we will work on with you to get you better. But it's also important for them to understand 
you know, this is where I am, this is my role, so that they can, for the most part, and somewhat embrace that role. We had a young lady who was at the end of the bench for two years, phenomenal, phenomenal kid. And she understood her role and she embraced her role. And she was a phenomenal leader as a senior. She didn't get on the floor very often, mm -hmm. but she was, she was positive. She knew the game. So she coached her teammates in timeout. She may say something to her teammates. And, and so she embraced her role because we communicated ahead of time. Look, this is your role. Are you okay with that? She said, yes, I'm okay with that. And we said, great, you are on the team. So I think that's important. That communication cannot get lost. And, and we have constant meetings throughout the season. If a player wants to know like, Hey coach, why am I not playing? We will be happy to talk about that. And, and we had a, a young lady who came to me and said, Hey coach, can we have a meeting? And I said, absolutely. And she was a sophomore and her and I talked about what she could do down the line to get more time. And she, she said, okay, coach, I understand. I, I got it. And, you know, she continued to work. So I, I think it's don't allow players to be in the dark about why they're not playing. I think mm -hmm. that's just, that's very important. Be upfront, be honest and have open communication. Yeah. I think communication solves a lot of things. I think being open and upfront and letting them know what it is that, that you see as a coach and what they need to do and what they need to work on especially if you can be preemptive in that conversation and be very clear and transparent. Uh, I, definitely super, super important. And I remember a situation just that I had uh, years ago when I, when I was coaching middle school was I had a player who wasn't playing a lot. And she asked me, you know, why, why am I not playing as much? Like, what can I do? And I told her like, you need to do X, Y, and Z and get better at these things. And then you can play more. And the funny thing is she did those things, but I remember as a coach, I forgot to mention the fact that, well, the other players might be doing those things too, and that, and they were. And so while she had gotten better at those things, the other players that had, were playing more, they got better at those things too. And so you definitely just want to make sure that you're very clear and, and open with your communication, and it comes with time for sure. Um, but I think that that definitely helps. And, like, and I think that you kind of alluded to this, that you want to make sure that your players understand where it is that you see them at. It doesn't seem to me that there's really any miscommunication of that. You're very open, you're very transparent, letting them know what you see. And in regards of that particular player, you wanted to make sure that you heard it from them, that they were okay with it and that you were on the same page because it's a lot easier to have that conversation in the beginning than it is in the middle of the season. A hundred percent, absolutely. I think it's very important you know, in those tryout times to, to kind of, you know, be upfront, open and honest with a player about this is kind of where you fit. Are you okay with that role? Um, and, 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 you know, we've had players say, no, I'm not. Um, and we've had most of them that say, yes, I am. So I think that's important because like you said, I think it's like you, you want to just be open and upfront and honest um, and be a good solid teacher and communicator um, with your players. And you, you mentioned uh, earlier in one of your responses how some of the players that you use from your bench, you might use them in more specific situations depending on your opponent. So I'm kind of interested in that. Is, is there a conversation that takes place before a game where, where you go to a player and say, hey, you know, we're playing this, this team, so you're going to be needed more to do X, Y, and Z as a role? How, how does that kind of get communicated or, or told to your players? So I think we are very, um, we are very detailed in our scouting reports in my program. Mm -hmm. um, you know, as I said, my, my coaches and I, we each rotate a scouting report. Um, and then after a practice prior to a game, we will actually sit down with the kids and, and fill out a complete scouting report. They each have a notebook um, that, that they write every detail about our, our opponent player by player, what they do offensively, defensively, overall. And then, yes, there are, there are conversations, you know, let's say we have a bigger team. I may, you know, talk to my, my post players and say, you know, in this game, we are really going to need you guys because we are going to need your rebounding. We're going to need your, um, you know, your presence around the basket, you know, and, or in another game, we may say, you know, to, like I said, if we're playing a, a more of a fast paced game, 
uh, more of a team that, you know, presses or, or pressures the ball, you know, I may say to my three point guards, I may need all of you today. Like I'm going to need all of you in the game, especially, you know, going down the stretch when we're really going to be pressured, I may have two or three point guards on the floor at the same time. Um, just because that's what gives your team the best option to win. And then we definitely, um, in, in our program, we definitely, at the end of the game, we definitely play offense, defense. We will, I will have uh, one or two kids sit next to one of my assistants and I'll just tell my assistants, if we're on defense, it's a dead ball. Put these two in. Don't ask me, just put them in. And if we're on offense and these two are sitting out, don't ask me, just put them in. Um, and again, that, that is very, uh, that takes, uh, you know, a lot of uh, practice and a lot of communication between you and your staff and a lot of communication between you and the players of like, we need you at the end of the game because we know you're going to hit the free throws or we know you can handle the ball on the flip side. We need you at the end of the game because we know you can prevent the other team from shooting a three um, or, you know, we need you in the game because we need your quickness on defense. So yes, that is definitely, it is definitely starts with our scouting. It definitely scouts with our preparation um, our, the, our players are never in the dark about what an opponent's going to do. Well, I shouldn't say that maybe the first game of the season, if the other team has not played yet, <laughs> um, they will be in the dark, but, um, no, we, we are prepared fully and our, and our players know exactly what the opponent's going to do and what their strengths are, um, in comparison to our strengths. And from a coaching perspective, I know that one of the things that, that, is difficult for me and ha has been difficult for me in the past is balancing having certain players out on the floor, but it's not the usual lineup of players that I would have. And all of a sudden I have, you know, two shooters, two ball handlers, and, you know, one kind of can do a little bit of everything and oh, I don't have any rebounders. And they've, these five have never been on the court with each other, anything like that. And it sounds like you're very mixed and matched and everybody's kind of needs to be ready to, have, be out there and, and do their role and, and make it work. Is there something in particular that you and your staff have maybe done so that you can kind of throw any combination that's out there and they're able to kind of just gel like that? Was this a process that took some time? Can you kind of walk us through that? You know, I think that's an interesting question. And, and I think it, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's one of those where I don't really think about basketball in the tr traditional like point guard, shooting guard, small forward, power forward, center. Um, aspect. I mean, last year uh, we started an, an entire starting lineup and no player was bigger than five, seven. Um, so, you know, it was one of those situations where, you know, we didn't really have a quote unquote, true traditional post player on the floor. Um, you know, and, and two, you know, I think something else that, that, you know, you always have to be prepared for is I remember a game last year where we had one post player out of town. The two other post players were in foul trouble. And that, here I am, I'm taking one of my guards and saying, you're in the middle of the two, three zone. Um, so I, I think it's for me, at least me personally, I'm not afraid to put my players really in any position. I think one, I, I will say, I think one that is um, assisted by our kind of quote unquote system, because we play so much zone um, we don't really have to ever think about like we need a post player to match up with their post player or um, mm -hmm. something we did uniquely last year was I actually put our post player. If you think about a traditional one, one, three, I actually put our post player on the, if you're facing the basket on the left side forward. And I actually put our best athlete in the middle. And the reason I did that was what do the majority of teams do against the zone? They look high post, short corner. So I took my best athlete, put them in the middle. And I just said, if they go to pass into the high post, just steal that pass. And if they pass into the high post, then you just match up one-on-one -on -one and everybody else will kind of almost match up. And then the other reason I put our big post player after, after I was thinking about it during a game on the left-hand side is where do the majority of people enter the ball? They enter the ball to the right. So the majority of shots come to the right. So I thought to myself, well, then I'm just going to put my post player on the left side and then she could just get all the rebounds out over there. Mm -hmm. um, so I think one, our system mm -hmm. kind of lends itself to that. Like offensively, we are, we run a five out system. 
Um, it, the majority of the principles come from the Villanova women's coach, uh, Coach Peretta, um, <clears throat> who nicely uh, a couple of years ago kind of talked me through the system. And it and it's very positionless. It's very mm-hmm. no mistake. If you look on some of his videos, all of his stuff says no mistake or positionless. So I, I think that kind of lends itself to, I just don't think about the game in terms of center, power forward, point guard um, that way. And, and I think that kind of transla- translates to our staff and to our players. And something that you mentioned earlier is you talked about the basketball IQ uh, that, that your players have. And I think that that's a huge advantage uh, to have players who kind of know the game and can think about the game in order to kind of be plugged in whatever position that they need to be plugged into. So kind of circling back to that, do you find yourself and your staff kind of teaching the game to your players so that they're malleable and able to be in every situation? Do they kind of come already with these certain mental skill sets? What's kind of the process of, of sort of teaching the game so that you feel comfortable kind of putting them in whatever position or wherever they need to be? That's a great question. So two things for sure that we focus on kind of going back to almost when you asked me about the, the behavior specialist mm-hmm. mindset the big thing for me is I want our players to know why we do stuff. Not just coach said we're five out pass and cut, but why, what are we doing to be successful and why are we doing it? So for example, why am I cutting? I'm cutting to create that double gap for my teammate to drive through. I'm cutting so that that provides my teammates space to drive to then set up the next drive and kick. So really it's understanding that why, or defensively, why are we covering an overload in our zone this specific way? Mm -hmm. I think when kids understand the why of the reason they're doing something, I think that helps them to be able to teach it to each other. Like one thing that we have been really proud of in our five years is because the older players understand why we're doing it, they're able to better help assist the younger players in understanding the why. Um, Another thing we do is I love, especially in the summertime, to match up an older player with a younger player. And I'll have the younger player draw up some things we do, but that older player is in charge of supporting them. So if I go back and look at why the younger player drew something up, I can say to the older player, why did so-and-so draw this up? Mm -hmm. Because that older player will be able to explain to me, you know what, coach, this is why. So I think that, that, that why piece is, is so important to what are we, what do they always say? The, the top, uh, the, uh, the best way to see if somebody understands something is if they can teach it to somebody Mm -hmm. else. Yep. So I, I, I think that's really, really important in our program to understanding uh, our system and developing that basketball IQ. I think the second thing is we encourage, I want our players to ask questions. Mm-hmm. I want them to say, if we're going over a scouting report from another team and I'm showing them how we're going to defend their, their baseline out of bounds plays, I want them to say, coach, why are we doing this and not this? I don't view that as, as the player challenging me. I view that as they're trying to understand. They're trying to get in their mind, hey, I'm going to wall up this post player or I'm going to be outside of this uh, forward um, offensively because of this reason. And I think because they're able to understand the why and because they're able to ask questions, I think that develops a, a strong basketball IQ. The last thing I'll say is I want players on the floor that are able to say, no coach, we should do it this way. I'm good with that. We were in a regional final my first year and my point guard, we were playing our two, three zone and and I went to switch it to a one, three, one. And she said, no, 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 no. Stay with the two, three. It's working. And I looked at her and I said, you know what? Go with it. (laughs) Um, And I love to say to my point guards all the time, you know, the ball might be entered off of a dead ball situation. And I'll look at them and say, what do you want to run? 
because they they know in those situations they know what's working they know sure. what actions are open so i i think you know if they understand the why and they're able to ask questions and you give them ownership to be able to say no coach this isn't working or in a timeout hey coach we should run this i think that empowers them to develop that basketball iq yeah i, I think that you just learn so much from asking your players and, and talking to your players and having them feel comfortable enough to ask you questions as well. There's just so much you can kind of gain from that. And if you're in, if you have an environment as a coach where your players feel comfortable asking questions, I think you're doing the right thing as a coach. If, if your players feel that that's something that they can do. Uh, now you kind of talked about the way that you play the fact that it just sort of naturally lends itself to, to substitutions and, and, and putting players in and out. I, I'm just curious from your own experience, do you have situations maybe that come up where you have five out there and, and they're just sort of rolling and, and, and you don't, you don't mess with that. And you like, let your players know like, Hey, like I may not go as deep into the bench this game because of what's happening or are, are you conscious of that or do you intentionally make sure you you sub players out even if things are going a certain way on the floor what's kind of that in-game process like you know I think with with our players I think sometimes I will say to players uh, for example I may take them out for a 30 second blow and I may say to one of my assistants, hey, tell me when so-and-so says she's ready. Mm -hmm. So my assistant may go down and say, hey, tell me when you're ready. Um, and, and I think we've developed that where, you know, the, the player may sit out for a minute or two and, and then just say, hey, tell coach I'm ready. My assistant will say, hey, so-and-so says she's ready. Mm -hmm. Then I have that in the back of my mind. Okay, so-and-so is ready to go back in. But I also think it's, it's one of those where, even if you have, um, even if you have that five that's going strong, let's be honest, they may be able to go strong for that two, three, four minutes. But even after four or five minutes, the best athletes are going to be tired. And it's it comes to that question of do you want so and so player out there playing well at 70%? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to give that next player the opportunity to go in at that hundred percent? So I, I think that's a I think that question's a balance. And I think that question is is almost a two-parter. I think first, second, third quarter, and the first half of the fourth, I think you still want to allow those other players to get that that time. You want them to get into that flow of the game. Again, in the last two, one, 30 seconds, I think, yeah, then at that point, then you're looking for specific kids in specific situations and specific roles to close out a close game. Well, you bring up kind of a interesting, I don't know if philosophical is the right word, but I'll use the word philosophical question to kind of think about where as a coach, if you have a player on the floor, who's at the point where they're at 70% and you have a player on your bench, who's at a hundred percent, but you don't trust that player who's at a hundred percent to go in for the player at 70%. I think that that's actually a good, good point of reflection for a coach to sort of think about maybe what's happened in, in, in the program or what's happened in the coaching where a player could be at 30% less than what they normally are. And you still trust them more than somebody who's at a hundred percent. I think that's actually a really interesting kind of a philosophical question for, for coaches to think about if they kind of get into that situation. Yeah. You know, I, I think that's an interesting, uh, the, the, the word trust. I, I think that's an interesting uh, word mm -hmm. to think about because, you know, I've said to my assistants before about players you know, that somebody may quote unquote, not trust. If a player's not picking up a concept, if a player's not picking up something we're supposed to be doing, if a player is not in the condition we need them in, um, you know, or they're not really learning what we want them to learn. Mm -hmm. Let's look back at ourselves. Are we teaching it the right way? Are we trying to hit all the different learning styles of a player? You know, I love to ask my players what their learning style is because it's interesting in coaching. So often the way we teach is auditory. But if you ask your players what way they learn best, 
almost none of them in my experience will say that they're auditory learners. They learn by seeing and they learn by doing. So it's one of those where if you go through an entire season and there's, and let's say you have a roster of the average 12, if you don't trust six of your players and throughout the entire season, you still don't trust them. I guess for me personally, I look back at it as, as a coach, have I developed them to be able to trust them more? Mm-hmm. And it kind of goes back to, you know, it, it's one of those where if you're in practice, are the same five starters playing together every day? Well, if they are, then of course those other seven, eight aren't going to get any better. So I, I think it's for me, one of those is if a player's not understanding something, just like in the classroom, if a student's not understanding something as a teacher, if I was teaching math and a student wasn't understanding something as a teacher, you would never say, oh, well, that student is not understanding something. It's all their fault. No, you would try to teach it to them <laughs> in a different way. Right. So I think, I think that goes back to that same question of coaching. Um, and, and the other thing I was talking to one of my assistants about too is if you're in year one, let's say, and you don't, you know, you don't have certain players that you trust. Okay. More understandable. If you're in year seven, eight, nine, 10, and every year you're finding that you don't trust more than half your team. Mm -hmm. I think at some point you need to look back at your player development and your coaching and, and think, am I really developing my whole team? Sure. And, and, and there's a couple of things with that, that I I really like that, that you kind of mentioned that it kind of made me think about Uh, number one is the fact that I can't control if my players are, you know, necessarily like putting in the work or I can't necessarily control certain things that the player is responsible for, but the things I can control are the ways that I teach things and the ways that I coach things. So if that's something that's within my control, then it behooves me if I want to have a successful program to try those different things. And I think that auditory tends to kind of be the default because it's usually the simplest one. It's the easiest one to just kind of spit something out and then just, ah, just go do it. Um, And I think the other ones take a little bit more time, but as as you mentioned, using different strategies, especially ones that are visual, you'll probably get a better result for putting in just a little bit more time, I I think. (laughs) I think that should be the case for sure. And just in general, if you want, your team to be successful you know there's all these variables but you can control what you do and it sounds like that's something that's really important for you is to be as flexible as you possibly can because that's something within your control I think it's one of those things where I grew up with a mom that was a special education teacher uh, and I have I a see. sister and I have a sister who's an, uh, an ESL or an English as a second language teacher and my background originally was as a special education mm-hmm. teacher so I think I have uh a very big heart for making sure that we as teachers are, are teaching to the students where they're at rather than where we're at. And I think if you walk players through your offense, as you said, it might take nine minutes as compared to you talking about it for four, but I bet you they will have bigger understanding by walking through it and physically doing it than you just talking it through. And the other thing too is, in a timeout, if you're drawing up something completely new that they've never worked on before in a 30-second timeout, <laughs> who among us could learn something brand new in 30 seconds and do it perfectly after you saw it on a clipboard? Very few of us. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> that is for sure. Not me at all. Yes. Uh, hun- yes. 100% agree with that. Um, so... Obviously, one of the concerns that that some coaches are going to have when it comes to kind of going deep in their bench or or maybe not just a concern, but just something that they kind of have to think about in the back of their mind is if they take a player out who's used to playing a lot, or maybe it's a star player, somebody who's who's really, really great and, and they don't like ever come out or they rarely come out and then kind of balancing that. I'm curious in your experience, if you had players who are just sort of heads and shoulders above everybody else where you've like kind of tried to keep them on no matter no matter what if you had situations where players get frustrated if they take them out just sort of these odds and ends that you've kind of dealt with as a coach if you can talk about those 
Yes, uh, yes, we have. Um, I have multiple players playing in college right now. Um, you know that, and we have had those players that are that are great. You know, I think it's one of those for me too. You know, when you talk about a star player. Is that star player a star because they're a scorer? Are they a star because they're a defender? Um, you know, I would say we have really good players. But again, I think let's be honest in a game, even if you're Michael Jordan and, <laughs> and you're playing an entire 48-minute game, are you really able to give that 100% for all 48 minutes? Now, maybe the greatest, you know, I'm from Chicago, as are you. Maybe, you know, someone like Michael Jordan, Magic Johnson, Larry Bird can. But, you know, on the, the average high school player, even if they're a great player, are they really able to be great for, in our, in our case, it's 32 minutes. Um, but could they be even better if, let's say you took them out for a minute a quarter, maybe that four minute extra break makes them even better down the line at the end of the game. So I, I think it's one of those where absolutely we have had great players um, and, and I, obviously they play a lot of minutes, but I think it's, you know, for some of those minutes, are you helping them be more successful at the end of the game? Because let's be honest, even for a great player, when mm -hmm. you're tired, the first thing to go is your mind because you start to think about oh, how, how tired you are. Yep. And that's, that's something we love to focus on is, you know, because we play the style we play, we wait to see when those other teams players kind of show they're tired and, you know, our kids do notice. So I, I think it's one of those where, again, not to go back to communication, but I think communication is so important and it's, it's that, that quote unquote star or that quote unquote really good player understanding that in the long run I'm going to be fresher mm -hmm. in game 30 because I did have some minutes off per game so in a 32 minute game if you play the the best player 26 minutes no it, that might not seem like a lot in yeah. one game but down the line that's six extra minutes times 30 extra games you're talking about a lot less time that they put pressure on their body. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I think that you sort of have to think as a coach about that, that sort of long-term impact. I think it's really easy. And I know I've done it before where I kind of get lost within that, that one particular game, right? That one game that you don't want to lose or that one situation you're in and you end up, you know, running your running your players into the ground, and, and maybe you get that victory. But then, like, oh wait, we got a game in two days, <laughs> and I just ran these, ran my players into the ground mm -hmm. for this one. And now, well, we'll see. I almost like forfeited the next one without even intending to, just because of being in that sort of mindset. And so, I think that I, I think that you're absolutely right about that. And it sounds like too, along with the idea of communication, it, it really sounds like with with your team, it's really important that your players support one another and that they they care about one another and they kind of have each other's backs and that it doesn't seem to me and I'll let you elaborate on it like if a player goes out and another player goes in that if they're family they're, that's not a problem at all because they're excited for that other player that other you know family member to go in am, am I right in thinking that you are 100% correct. And that definitely goes back to that family stays united aspect. I think it, it is extremely important. You know, that, that old phrase of, you know, body language never whispers, it screams. I think, you know, you want to make sure that anytime your teammates are in there and they do something well, you are up clapping, cheering. Um, one of the things we do um, that makes us unique. I don't actually know any of our opponents that, that does this, but prior to the jump ball, my entire team is up clapping, standing, all the coaches, all the players uh, cheering that girl on who's doing the jump mm -hmm. ball. And I, I think right away that that sets the tone of, you know, we're going to cheer each other on. We're going to be positive and we're going to support one another. And like you said, that goes back to family stays united. That's the most important thing in our program. That is our culture. That it that is our makeup um, to support one another. And I, I I think that's great. I, I think that it probably takes away so many potential 
issues or or possibilities of there even being an issue if you know that everybody has each other's back and they know that okay i got taken out well that's okay you know i'll get a quick break now i get to you know cheer on and support you know my my friend or my family member so to speak who's out there on the court and and be the best teammate that i can be for that person and i'm sure that cuts down on so many potential uh issues or, or problems that that may occur so i think that that that's super super beneficial and, and super useful so in your practice situations i just kind of wanted you to kind of touch on this and kind of add on it a little bit more when you are going through your practices and let's say you're going through you know the the zones that you do or, or just going through your offense are you always kind of just putting you know, different matchups of five people out there? Do you even have in your mind like a certain five that, that you know you're going to start with? So you start with them. I'm just really curious in terms of that kind of mixing and matching and how it kind of goes into going through maybe more your five-on-five -five situations that you do in practice. Every single day I mix it up. I've never have the same five out there. Um, we don't, I don't have like a situation where I'll put like the starters or you know, any scenario, I constantly mix it up because I, I just truly believe that when you're mixing it up, you're going to see different matchups. You're going to see different kids excel in different areas. Mm -hmm. um, and and I, I just think it, it benefits everybody because then everybody has the same equal opportunity to learn and compete and get better in practice. Um, I love to, um, like, if we scrimmage, I love to give like an assistant coach, one group of six or seven and another assist coach, another group of six or seven. Um, and the other thing I love to do in scrimmages and practices, I love when they coach themselves Yeah, because you will see more of what the kids believe in when they scrimmage themselves <laughs> than when you tell them what to do. And if you see the players consistently doing a certain aspect of your offense, your defense, you know what that tells you? It tells you that's what they believe in. Sure. Um, so I, I just think those are super important is to you know we mix up every day, um, just different matchups. And is that at all, does that ever get like stressful for you to have all these like different combinations or do you enjoy the process of having them like figure it out? Do you find yourself like stopping to, to reteach or have them, you know, ask questions? I'm just curious about how messy and not even in a bad way, but just kind of how messy does that get when you sort of mix everybody in and, and do things that way? You know, I, I, I don't, I don't ever think I thought it was messy. I, I, I think it's, um, I just think it's a great opportunity for the staff and, and the, the players themselves to, to see how they match up against mm -hmm. each other. Uh, I learned a long time ago from a former uh, boss of mine, a former head coach of mine when I was an assistant, a great way to see and to show the players and the coaches um, who the better players are is do a one-on-one -on -one tournament. And you'll really see in that one-on-one, -on -one, those one-on-one -on -one games, you'll see when so-and-so is at the top of the mountain and so-and-so might be towards the bottom. Mm -hmm. And that also kind of shows the kids like, oh, I'm in this part of the one-on-one -on -one tournament. Okay, <laughs> well, maybe that tells me something. Um, but no, I, I've never viewed it as, as messy. I, I view it as I, I love the competition. I love to see who matches up with who. Um, don't get, don't get me wrong. There's times in practice where I may say you've guarded so-and-so for four days in a row. You know, you two are, this isn't a really competitive matchup anymore. You're going to go guard so-and-so and you're going to go guard so-and-so. Sure. Um, <laughs> and I, I love, I love to see my starters match up against each other too. I, I just think that it brings a level of fun and, and competition. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I think that you learn a lot. I like that one-on-one -on -one idea too. You really get to learn about, who your competitors are too. Cause you get some players who if it's just one-on-one -on -one, it, they kind of get this like different mindset and you're like, Oh, okay. I didn't see that side of you or you really <laughs> see that side kind of come out of them in a one-on-one, -on -one, a little bit more ego involved a bit in a, <laughs> you know, me versus you sort of situation. Now that's, that, that's great. All right. So, so coach to, to, to wrap up, there's a couple questions that I, that I ask every, every guest. And so I'll start here with this first one. Um, what is a coaching moment? from your career that you think others listening would be able to learn from? You know, it's interesting, coach. This was the question when you sent the questions ahead of time that I really sat down and thought about <laughs> the most. 
Um, you know, I would say a couple things. I would say one, you don't need to have superstar, big name assistant coaches. You need people that are loyal and committed. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all I look for now when hiring an assistant. I think you can hire the greatest superstar head coaches, but if they don't have your back, they don't have the program's best interest in mind, and they're not committed, then the, their, their basketball acumen really doesn't matter very much. Sure. Um, and, and I truly think, and I, I know I've hit on this a couple of times, but I, I truly think um, above all else, at least in my experience, is that culture above all, all else matters the most. Mm. I think you can have the most talented team, but if they don't like each other, they don't play well together, they don't, they're not coachable, th the talent in the end doesn't matter as much. I think it means so much more to me, like I said, when the, when the players enjoy being around each other, when we do team bonding stuff, I think that's a, a big thing in our program. Um, and, and, you know, I, I just think that means so much more than the wins and the losses. And don't get me wrong. I'm <laughs> more, com most competitive as anybody, but, you know, and we're always striving to be the best, but I think, you know, we have three big pillars in our program and we have a rules and expectations manual. Um, and, and our big three pillars are attitude, commitment, and effort. Um, and if you see my Twitter posts of our program, you'll always see hashtag ACE, A-C-E. Mm -hmm. um, and then obviously family stays united, which is FSU. And the last thing I would say to, to any coach is always be true to yourself. I think if you're in a game and it's a close game and, and you decide to go with someone else's idea, be okay with if that idea doesn't work, that was really your idea. Um, and, and I think that's so important is to always be true to yourself Two two losses in my career in particular stand out. And, and it's when I went with someone else's idea at the very end of the game at the, at the last second of the game and we lost. And I just remember both bus rides home thinking to myself, I didn't go with my gut and we lost and I have to live with that. So mm -hmm. just understanding, you know, if you're, you're a coach out there, make sure in the end, you're always true to yourself and what you believe, because even then, if you lose, you can still say, I did what I thought was best. I might've lost and I'm going to learn from that, but, but I followed my gut. Sure. So. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, it's kind of a level of ownership that, that you kind of kind of take at that at that point for sure. And uh, I like the point that you mentioned about the uh, the people that you hire. I think that the staff that you hire, I think that's just so important and make sure that your staff is there uh, for the right reasons because you could have hopefully in an ideal world, you'll have a coach who you know loves basketball and, and is there for the kids. but you know, we've all had coaches that maybe we know who love basketball maybe more than coaching the kids or, or situations like that and, and just know who you have in your program because everybody in, in your program uh, is a reflection of the school and, and everything like that everybody who's on the staff and everything so I think that that's a really really great point and uh, to wrap up coach I go ahead and give every uh, coach that I call like the 60 second soapbox uh, it's a platform for you to get out your final message your closing thought your closing idea that you kind of want to leave uh, the listeners with so coach I'm going to go ahead and give you the floor for your 60 60 second soapbox. I think, first of all, thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, if any coaches want to reach out, you know, I'm always happy to talk basketball. Um, you know, second, I have my own uh, podcast too, uh, after the timeout. So feel free to follow me on Twitter, uh, Spotify, Apple, myself and, and my partner, Coach Zazadil. Um, and I, I think in the end, I think we all love the game of basketball. We all love what we do. Uh, I think we've all learned to appreciate it even more in what we do during COVID, mm -hmm. um, having it somewhat taken away from us. But, uh, you know, in the end, just remember, just take care of the kids uh, and the rest of it all falls into place. So uh, hashtag FSU, hashtag ACE. <laughs> Good. Couldn't say it any, any better myself. Great, Coach. Uh, coach, I want to thank you for spending your time to talk about going into your bench, talk about program philosophies, the coaching philosophies. It was a really fun conversation. I appreciate it. Uh, coach Palicki, thank you. Hopefully you have some games to coach going forward and uh, best of luck to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Go Bandits.
<laughs> Thank you guys so much for listening. This is another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. We'll see you guys next time. Thank you for listening to another edition of the Basketball Teacher Podcast. Make sure to connect with us on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitter, or reach us directly through email at basketballteacherpodcast at gmail.com. Take care, be safe, and we'll see you next time.